Welcome everyone to my talk. The next 45 minutes will be about SecComp, especially SecComp for developers and how to make applications more secure without inventing your own security. So this is our plan for today. I would like to talk about like what SecComp is, uh, how SecComp got added to the Linux kernel and why you should care as a developer. And the next step will be to talk about SecComp used in high-level languages. There's often a notion that if you need low-level features from the Linux kernel, you cannot use those in high-level languages like Java, Crystal, or Python. And this is not true. And at the last part, I want to show how to monitor those kind of second violations. Before we get started, maybe let's take a quick step back of why I'm talking about this. And you might remember my name from last year, where I was also at sec 4 dev and talked about Elasticsearch and what kind of different measured measures it used to remain secure. And one of those measures is using SecComp and leveraging SecComp to prevent execution from any processes within the Elasticsearch process. And that was a part where I thought, like, how can I make this more accessible to others? How can I talk about this in a way that um, it's easy to understand that SecComp also has use in other applications and especially in your own applications? And Elastic as a company has a high interest in keeping services secure because we are running Elasticsearch as a service ourselves using Elastic Cloud. So we really want to make sure that all of those services, including Elasticsearch at Beats and Logstash and Kimbahana, are running as secure as possible. The same applies to the three solutions, which are basically running on top of the stack. So the stack itself consists of four different pieces, Kibana being the management and monitoring UI, Elasticsearch being the distributed system, um, storing all the data, querying all the data, and you can use Beats and Logstash to ingest data. And Elasticsearch and Beats are basically both using SecComp features right now within the stack. So before we continue, let's potentially take a step back of why we should talk about this and why security is such an important requirement. And in, in terms of Elasticsearch and probably also for your own application, um, adoption is an important piece, right? If there's thousands of downloads a day of your software, you really want to make sure that the software itself is as secure as possible. And if someone finds a security problem, it probably permeates to thousands or hundreds of thousands of instances over the internet. So security is always a requirement. And even if you write new features, you have to take care that you don't break your existing security model. I already said that Elastic as a company is also offering Elastic Stack as a service. This means you want to run it or you need to run it yourself. And this also means you want to make sure that it runs as secure as possible by default. And you could do assumptions about the environment, like in, in the context of Elasticsearch or also if you write your own software, probably your customers can download the software and run it on their own systems, maybe within a Docker container, maybe on on-prem hardware. We have no idea about the environment, right? We don't even know the operating system in a Java application. So we can't do any assumptions about that. This means if you use a security feature like AppArmor or SE Linux, you probably leave out half of the Linux distributions and run with reduced security. And this is something that you usually would try to avoid. Also, it probably makes sense to have multiple layers of security up and running. Um, in terms of Elasticsearch, this usually means the Java Security Manager is enabled and SecComp is enabled. Um, we also do a little bit of different things, but uh, for example, we try to prevent execution of arbitrary commands with both of those layers. So even if one fails, there's still another. So what is SecComp? Let's talk about the problem first and why SecComp had been added. And the basic idea of all of this is that you do want to run untrusted code in your system. And untrusted code could be the Elasticsearch instance that you're downloading. Untrusted code could be the code from a neighbor. Uh, untrusted code usually is all the JavaScript in your browser and your browser just execute this. And your trust in your browser's security capabilities to not open arbitrary files or send arbitrary data all across the internet if you open someone else's website. And there are several ways you could do this. Um, you could use virtualization and run every process in its own virtual machine. But of course, this is really slow, really expensive from a resources point of view. Um, you could try something more lightweight, like isolation. Um, there's something like JavaScript isolates if you want to Google for that. Um, or you could just try to reduce the um, code itself, what it can do. And that's the core idea behind SecOM. Uh, you want to limit the code to prevent certain dangerous system calls. Now, if we take a look at the history lesson, like the, the whole idea behind SecComp has been there for a long, long time. So the, 
The first kind of similar idea was happening in 2005 in Linux kernel 2.6. Um, and a developer added something called a strict mode, which only allowed for certain system calls like read, write, exit, and sync return. And you could basically enable the strict mode. Um, we are echoing a number in the proc file system. And the basic idea of this mode was that you could rent out CPU resources to processes, and those processes couldn't do anything malicious, um, like sending data across the network where it should not send to, or executing code, something like that. Of course, this was really limited because you could not configure the system calls or anything like that. You could really just say, now I'm running in strict mode. Uh, this was over time added as a dedicated argument to the PRCTL system call, which kind of serves as a multiplexer for a lot of different things. Um, and things got really going in 2012 with the Linux kernel 3.5, where instead of having a fixed set of system calls that you were able to execute, you could suddenly configure the policy of what is allowed to be executed or not. And this made things really different because suddenly you had the ability to configure those processes, to configure their limitations and be much, much more flexible. And over time, there was also an own dedicated SecCom system called edit, but the basic idea of having, of being able to configure a filter and this filter is basically run in the background has existed since 2012. So. One of the key factors here is this is not 100% a new thing. It has been in the Linux kernel for a long time. Uh, there are also many, many SecComp users. Um, I will talk Elastic, about Elasticsearch and Beats later, but uh, Docker uses it to limit the number of available system calls uh, in codes, in, in containers. Uh, Systemd allows you to configure policies so that certain processes um, cannot execute certain actions. It's used heavily in Android. Uh, Chrome and Firefox use it to limit the scope of what code is able to execute. OpenSSH, um, the execution environment for AWS Lambda called Firecracker is using it as well. As well. So there are lots of or a fair share of users and most of them are, are kind of rather low level where you don't really see how it's used. And you don't also, you don't even notice, right? Um, it's just there and the code itself basically configures its own security policy. So how does this work? The basic idea here is that the process tells the operating system to limit its own abilities. You could also do the same with a management process, but the basic idea is that the person who wrote the code also knows best of what the process is actually allowed to do. And this means that the person who wrote the code also could write a rule set of what this process for surely is not allowed to do and just take action on that, like killing the process. And of course, one of the big features of this is that this must be a one-way transition, so you cannot change the state later on, otherwise this security could be revoked. And you basically set up a list of allowed and blocked calls and what kind of action you would like to execute if one of those system calls is called in your program. And this list is called a SecCom filter. This SecCom filter gets set up and then you will either use the PRCTL SecCom call or in newer kernels, which pretty much all of the LTS distributions now have nowadays, I just go with a second system call. We can go on with a, with a simple example. Um, there's a command line tool called FireJail, which allows you to kind of reduce the capability of a process further. There are profiles for certain um, programs like uh, browsers, uh, Chrome, Firefox, but you can also configure a second policy. And uh, you can see it up here that if you want to drop or if you want to reject the bind system call, uh, you can just configure it with this command line switch. And what I'm trying to execute here is netcat. Netcat starts a small server on the on the network and listens on a port, like port 8000 in this example, uh, and I'm using strays to uh, spill out the, the system calls. So if we run this, you can see here that the byte system call is not finishing successfully, right? Usually you would get a uh, a successful return operation here because the bind is successful if there's not another service listening on it. In this case, however, the whole process has been killed by uh, sixes, which means the second policy basically found out that there was a bind system call and killed the process because there was part of the policy. So if you would like to know more, you could now check the demask output and see which system call was involved, like there's a 49, which kind of somewhere maps, uh, depending on the architecture, uh, to the bind system call. And you can see which command had been executed, apparently on the Debian system, uh, and see as a symlink to another tool. Um, you can also use the 
AU search from the audit tools a package command line tool where you can kind of search uh, based on syscalls, for example, but the basic idea is there's the, the kernel log, the audit log that will list you with this kind of, of a second violation. And we could go now through all of the single fields, like what, what does each of that mean, but I don't think that's really useful because I've been talking for a couple of minutes now about second, how to set it up, but I think we need to take back another step and ask ourselves, like, why is this useful from a developer perspective? And this is what I said a couple of minutes ago. I said, you can run untrusted code in your system using seccomp and just let the code exit when it is doing something malicious. Think about this. Your code probably is untrusted code. Let's take an old school example. Maybe some of you still remember the CGI bin days where you just had a folder where your FTP uploaded some Perl scripts into and you just hope nothing bad would happen. Uh, in this example, I would just take the first argument and execute it uh, and return the response. So if this would be our Perl script, we could just run, run a ping minus C1, a single ping command, sending only a single packet, to the argument. So this is how it's supposed to run. In this example, I would just run ping minus C1 on the 1.1.1.1 IP address. You could try to be fancy because you're spawning a subshell in here, which you should never do if you can actually prevent it. Um, and we could run arbitrary commands as well. We could try to circumvent some input parsers, um, or we could overwrite the existing parameter and just let this process run forever in the background. Uh, if you have a, a certain limit of the number of parallel processes or threads that the web server is spawning, you could potentially create a denial of service out of this. You could also try to write into the tempfoo directory and see if you can fill up the disk space if you want. So there's a couple of, yeah, possibilities that you could here uh, do with such a kind of super insecure program. Also, there's more to it, right? I was just saying, yeah, we are going to use the ping binary, but you should probably check who owns ping and what permissions it has, because the moment you have something like this, where you use another binary, you're also owning the security for this binary. So in this example, we have a set UID binary, which means that whenever you run ping, it's run with root privileges. Uh, this is needed because by default certain capabilities uh, for certain ping or icmp based data sending needs elevated privileges but this means if there is a security issue in the ping binary it basically goes all the way through your start stack up until your web application and you own all of these right for for ping there's a luckily um, slightly different variant of ping available which doesn't need root privileges and runs as well but the, the basic idea here is just because you're calling external comments doesn't mean that you're not responsible for the security of these commands. If you want to know which processes are using an arbitrary seccomp policy, uh, you can pretty much grab this from the status file for each process. And in this example, we see that there's uh, about yeah, six processes, three of them are System D processes that are using seccomp, those is the Elastic stack. Uh, there's an audit beat which monitors seccomp violations and can do much more, but for the sake of the later example, it's only doing this. And the Elasticsearch Java process that is using seccomp. And this is a sample program that we will take a look at later. So let's talk about seccomp filters again. Seccomp filters is a set of rules where every system call that your program is doing is basically checked against. Now that sounds rather inefficient and expensive. However, this is written in BPF. BPF is something you might know from a tool called um, TCP dump or Wireshark, when you filter for certain network IPs, ports, addresses, what have you, uh, you also use this, it's called the Berkeley packet filter. And it's kind of a small language that has a couple of really interesting capabilities. It's also like really limited in its functionality. But one of the features in there is that with this language, you can create any loops like while true or you can jump backwards. This means that you always have a defined end of your program, whereas when you write a Java Python application, you could just end up in a loop. Um, there's also a, a detection of dead code. And at the end, a BPF program is a directed acyclic graph, which uh, always has a determined finish. The interesting part is that this kind of filtering is not done in user space, it's done in kernel space. And this is what makes it so efficient and fast. Uh, 
And this is also the reason why you don't have to worry so much about a SACOM filter, a BPF filter, stealing all of your application's performance. Um, because you basically create this filter, it's put into the kernel space, and from then on, uh, you can, you don't have to worry about it anymore. So for every check, you basically have a set of possible outcomes. The system call could be allowed, the process or the thread could be killed, so you could kill the whole process or just this existing thread, um, or you could just say, I'm sorry, this is not allowed, but your application keeps running. Um, this is, for example, what Elasticsearch is basically doing. Uh, because we want to make sure that Elasticsearch is still able to serve regular requests, but if there is a second violation, we want to make sure we tell the user, look, something is fishy here, you're not allowed to do this. So let's take a look of how to use SACOMP in different languages. Um, I have a couple of code samples in a GitHub repository, which is in, in Python and Crystal. We will take a look at that in a minute. Uh, but we can also take a look now at the Java and Go, where I just have a couple of slides with me. So one of the regular excuses is if you have a high-level language that you cannot call a low-level syscall like SACOMP. Um, however, pretty much every programming language has APIs and the ability to call native code. So this is not an excuse. It just means you have to invest some more work. And Elasticsearch has an own dedicated class. It's called the system call filter. Uh, we can take a quick look at that one. And if we scroll at the top, we see it's 600 lines, which seems to be a lot. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. And this one is the class which is doing all of the, the SACOM setup. So you can take a look and also use it for your own tools. So what basically happens here is that the um, Java program or the Java class instantiates something called a SOC filter, which is the core of the BPF program. You can see there are BPF statements, there are BPF jumps. Um, and what basically happens here is that if one of those system calls, fork, we fork, exec, ve, exec, we add, is called, we will not allow this. We will return um, an error and say the user is not allowed to do this. Because one of the things that we know within Elasticsearch is like the moment Elasticsearch is up and running and listening on the network, we never ever want to fork a process. Like this is a security violation. We know that there's something really wrong if that happens. So this is the, the BPF policy within Elasticsearch. And the next step is basically to install this policy. And first, Elasticsearch tries to call the SACOM syscall here. If that doesn't work, because maybe the kernel is too old, the PRCTL syscall will get called. And there will be one final PRCTL system call to retrieve back the SACOM policy to see if it was successfully installed or not. If not, then uh, Elasticsearch stops and will not start. And those are the three important system calls just shown again. You can see here that this is not like Java you may used to because we are using kind of an equivalent of pointer there. And the reason for this is that the so-called JNA library is used called Java Native Access, which allows you to access native shared libraries without JNI. So you don't have to write own code. You can just execute syscalls like you would do in other low-level programming languages. So shifting gears a little bit and taking a look at Go, uh, like how we do in, in Libbeat, um, the uh, implementation there is acting a little bit different because in Elasticsearch, uh, the default policy is to allow things and only to reject those four system calls that I just showed you. Whereas in the Beats, it's basically vice versa. The default action is to return an error. And then there's a long list of system calls that are actually allowed. So um, this means that if you add a new feature, you have to make sure that the list of system calls is still valid so that the program doesn't stop. The next language would be Crystal. Uh, for those who don't know, Crystal is a Ruby-like programming language, I would say, which has features like static typing. But the most interesting part is um, it's using LLVM to create a binary out of lit, and that makes it really, really fast. Um, and that is a really interesting use case also for tools like command line applications uh, because you can write interesting uh, programs with that and it's uh, rather easy to learn compared to maybe something like Java. So um, Crystal also has a SACOMP um, shard or a dependency package that you can use and reuse. Um, in this example, I'm also doing the same what Elasticsearch is doing. Uh, the default policy is to allow things, but if one of those system calls is called, um, I do not want those to, to be caught. And then this policy gets loaded, and after that, 
within this program, within this Crystal program, you will not be able to fork other processes. We'll take a look at that one in a second in, in the code um, and quickly talk about SACOM in Python. It's, it's looking the exact, exactly the same here. Again, we'll take a look at the code and now it's time for a demo. So I've already prepared my example over here. Um, this is a GitHub repository that I will also share at the end of my talk. Uh, you can just clone it and test things yourself. Um, there's a Vagrant virtual machine, so all you have to run is Vagrant up. I already did that, and I can use Vagrant SSH to log into my machine. So let's take a look at the, at the Crystal code. So uh, I basically have a very simple web server here that executes a com or tries to execute a command and return the output back to the client. Um, there are a couple of options like enabling or disabling seccomp. And this is our core here. We are intentionally trying to run bin ls, the binary, um, by forking it and then returning the response back to the client. And we can configure seccomp optionally. So if we run this, there is a uh, well, we don't need to supply an argument, so by default, we just fire up a web server. And now we can use curl to get the output of the directory where this one was started. Now, what I can do next is I can enable the second policy by just starting with minus s, and this will load um, the second policy. Now, if I run this again, and I call curl, you can see here in the top that this operation is not permitted because the second policy did not allow this system call. And this is basically the, the second policy at work. And of course, I can't return anything because I, I did not properly catch the exception, but this is the basic idea of this. And um, as you can, or as we can take another look, let's close this again. Um, the whole class or the whole second policy itself is just a couple of lines long in this example. And the same also applies to the Python implementation. And it's even shorter. Um, we also import the web server, we import the second package. Um, we try to run bin ls here, just like in the crystal part. And we also set up a syscall filter to allow everything by default. But if one of those system calls comes up, we better disable it. The functionality is pretty much the same. We can run the app. And running a curl will return the contents of the directory. If I enable second and rerun this, you see that I get the exact same error message with operation not permitted. So if you have code that doesn't need any execution of other binaries, uh, this might actually be a viable alternative. However, you also need to be aware that all of the dependency that you're using within your application is also not calling any processes in this example. And this means you need to be really aware of your dependencies and how they are running. So what could you do to improve this situation by maybe come up with a monitoring instance first. And this is the, the basic idea of this minus L switch over here that you load your second policy, but you do not drop the system calls, you just lock them. And by doing this, instead of dropping them, you can basically run this for a day or a week in this logging mode, check if there are any second violations. And if they are not, you can just apply your second policy. So let's do that for a second. We run this with the with the lock ability, uh, we can quick take a quick look uh, in the kernel lock uh, to see if there are any second violations. Um, the last lock uh, is coming from my pseudo call that I just did a second ago. Uh, let's do another curl call. And you can see here the ls minus la was executed successfully. But when I'm running the mask, you can see that there was actually a second violation being locked, right? With a, with a syscall, uh, you can see the binary here that was Python 3.7, which is installed on this machine. Um, and by just observing those second violations, you can pretty much figure out if you need to adapt your code, if you need to adapt your second violation, 
uh, if you want to maybe dig deeper of who is actually doing this kind of calls um, before you then really go live with your second policy. So there's one more thing we should probably talk about, and that is the monitoring of second violations, right? We just saw it over here that you can use something like DMask, and that probably makes sense. But of course, if you run in a different setup, like on top of Docker containers, if you have many, many instances up and running, uh, then DMask is not your, your tool of choice. So you would probably like to do something different. I would just run this curl um, a couple of times in the background uh, to create some noise so we can see it in a second. Um, so what I've basically done here in addition to this is that I also started a whole Elastic stack uh, in the background on this Vagrant virtual machine. So if you want to try out things, you can do the exact same. And it's mapped to localhost, so I can open up Kibana over here. And the next step that we can do is that we can take a look, let me make this bigger, that we can take a look on dashboards to see or to see if there are any second violations being logged. And you can see here there are different system calls. This is probably uh, the SU call that I did. And if we go over here, there's a constant inflow of second violations. Uh, the reason for this is that I just called it in a loop in the background to run the curl request against the Python application that keeps logging this as a second violation. Um, you can also disable the logging of those violations if you don't need them anymore, but I think it makes a ton of sense to take a look at those. And uh, what basically happens here is that a tool called AuditBeat, which is also running or would need to run on each of your servers, monitors the second violations and then sends this to Elasticsearch. So you could now start to uh, limit this based on the hosts or see if you have a similar second violation on all of your web servers all of a sudden. So you know that there's potentially a interestingly crafted request going around um, and get an overview over your whole infrastructure regarding this. And I think that is really, really important because if all of your logs are just ending up in your kernel log, then no one will ever see the light of any second violations in there. And you can also see here which system call was actually tried to be executed. In our example, it's always exec.ve because this is what trying to run the process within the Python application uh, is actually tried to be executed. Okay, let's get back to the slides. So I quickly talked about monitoring second violations. Um, you saw this dashboard, which allows you to kind of drill down between all of the different um, event categories that the audit beat is able to lock. Um, on top of that, if you're more interested in how this actually works, the basic idea here is that the audit beat picks up the, um, the second violations or the second blocks and sends them over to Elasticsearch. So it basically takes the event, it converts it into JSON, and then it's stored in Elasticsearch and the dashboard itself is querying Elasticsearch and grouping everything together to give you this dashboard overview. Now, when you take a look at the single document, it may look a little bit convoluted at the beginning because there's a small event like a single second violation and you will end up with quite a big document. Um, but it's kind of a standardized format. It's called ECS, the Elastic Common Schema. And this allows you to reuse um, the dashboards for many different use cases. Uh, this is why there's a, this kind of different inner nesting, if you want, um, just to make sure that it doesn't confuse you too much if you ever take a look at the raw data. Let's get to the summary. We have a couple of, of things ahead to tell, and one of the things I want to repeat for developers is that Second is a great mechanism. It's been battle tested. Some of the biggest software in the world is using it. Um, so I don't think there's a real argument against it. And people tell you that it's insecure compared to their probably self-written security implementation. Um, so this is, this is important for people who maybe wrote their own secure wrapper to not execute commands within their, their program. Maybe you don't even need that. And what is even more interesting is that a lot of other operating systems have similar features under different names with slightly different semantics. So um, macOS also has a mechanism to try to prevent the execution of commands. It's not as powerful as a second BPF filter, but like the use case that we have within Elasticsearch, it works as well. And the system call filter class at the beginning that I showed over here um, features this for many different operating systems, including Windows. 
which also has no name. So you may want to take a look at this uh, and make sure that you actually have don't have a big reason to say, but I'm running under this operating system, I, I can't enable this feature. Um, you have to take a little bit of care because like different names, different semantics, but the core idea is the same for all of the operating systems. So I hope that I've shown you that this is rather easy to implement, also in higher level languages. Um, the main reason for this is that someone else has already sat down and implemented libraries, like for Crystal, like for Python. Uh, for Python, the good case is that the developer of the libseccomp library, of the C library, also maintains the Python package, so it's always up to date and you never have to worry of running behind in time or something like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's well maintained. And you also saw that the number of lines that you added to your program was rather small compared to the security gain that you probably got. And when you take a closer look, there are different packages in different languages. I already mentioned the Python one. The Crystal one is a little bit older, but um, works just fine. Uh, there are two different packages in Go. One is from Elastic itself, because uh, this one also supports reading a YAML file with the allowed system calls. Uh, then there's a couple of them in Rust. There's even one in Perl, but I didn't find anything for Ruby and Node. So uh, if you want to write one, feel free to go ahead and publish it. And of course, if there is no package in your language, you could still create a profile using FireJail or other tools or AppArmor or SE Linux. But I always tell people like, if you want to make sure that software runs in an environment that you don't control and you want to make sure it runs the way you want it to run, you have to integrate these kind of features natively in your app, right? From an Elasticsearch perspective, we have to make sure that we call this code, that we install the second policy, that Elasticsearch fails if it's not installed. And this is important, right? You don't want to offer any way of disabling. Um, like in, in this context, this was added in Linux kernel 3.5 and uh, changes in 3.17. I think most of the LTS releases, including all of their support time, should now be out of this, even something like CentOS. Um, so you can go rather safely by not providing a way of disabling this at all. Also, you have to make sure that you abort if storing the second BPF filter was not successful. And this is a really good solution in my perspective if you don't control the execution environment, if you don't know the security solution running on the systems, if there is any, if you don't know the operating system in, in the context of Elasticsearch. Uh, because this way you know either it works or it doesn't, but if it doesn't work, you can probably sit down and figure out what is the issue. But when it's up and running, you know it's running in the most secure possible configuration. Yeah, I don't think I have to say this at a security conference. Uh, which makes things easier. You should not run your own security. Uh, if there's something as heavily tested as SecComp, it's probably a bad idea to go over there instead of trying to be fancy with Java and write your own agent that wraps the runtime um, class or something like that. And of course, uh, you probably would like to rethink your design. Like the example I showed at the beginning uh, could have been solved immediately with proper validation, like making sure that only a valid IP address can be typed into that. Uh, but if you start validation with regular expressions, uh, funny things can happen. So maybe that was not the best idea either. Um, so it's it's tricky, right? But validating inputs is something you should be always doing, of course. Uh, I already talked about that. Uh, I also would like to encourage everyone to not call binaries in your apps because then you are responsible for maintaining them. Um, if you're fine with that, it's okay. But um, this also would mean that you could not go with the policies that I just showed. And thinking about proper isolation is usually a really good idea. Um, imagine you have a service that needs to call a binary. Is it really necessary that calling this binary happens within your web server or can you have another, another layer in between that? And um, this could be done by isolating, like imagine you have your web application and imagine you have a daemon that is actually calling this binary. Um, then you would have different processes with proper isolation. So each of those processes could like have a different second policy applied, uh, could drop their privileges in a different way and they could be communicating over a Unix domain socket if they run on the same system um, and would not even need a network connection, so the daemon would not be exposed to the outside. Uh, you could do things like authentication, but of course, everything comes with a cost. The cost here clearly is um, additional operational complexity. Uh, if you run this within containers, you will have to have not a Unix domain socket, but rather a network connection. So again, then authentication suddenly is not optional anymore. And everything comes with the cost and like isolation in this case is usually bound to additional operational complexity. 
but in many, many cases, I would be rather willing to actually pay this price. And yeah, that's it. Um, those are my slides for now. Uh, there's a couple of things that may be interesting for you. The first is a second samples repository. Uh, you can just go there on GitHub and see the, the same code that I showed earlier on. There's a Vagrant file, so all you have to do is basically running Vagrant up, wait a little bit until everything is installed, and that's it. Uh, if you want to know more about SecComp in the Elastic stack, uh, I wrote a post about that um, one and a half years ago, roughly, what SecComp is and how it's used in the stack. And last but not least, um, this is basically a part of my, of my talk from last year at sec for dev which I now wrote into a blog post. As you can see, it's a, it's a rather, rather long read, uh, but it will show a little bit more what else Elasticsearch is doing in terms of security. Thank you for listening. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer any of those. You can also always write me an email or ping me on Twitter, and I will be uh, trying to get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you, and have a nice day and the rest of the conference. See you.